following interview was conducted with Herbert Schmeider, Chef Hubert, Hubert Schmeider, Schmeider. Schmeider, Chef Emeritus of Purdue University for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, August the 4th, 2008, in Stewart Center 263. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in your early years. Well, I was born on January 6, 1929, in the Black Forest in Germany. And my father was a lumberjack, and I have a brother and a sister. And my mother was a housewife, and we had a small farm like in most places. We had some animals, and we had some fields which belonged to us, and the land belonged to us some, and some of them we leased. And we planted potatoes and oats, and there was not many fruits in the Black Forest, only maybe uh, cherries and maybe some some apricots, but otherwise nothing, or pears, but nothing exotic. And um, my father, they would slaughter a pig once a year, and we would sell the milk or make butter, and we, we were pretty sufficient as far as, as far as the basic foodstuffs we needed from day to day. And uh, my grandfather was also a lumberjack, and my, my grandfather on my father's side he, he did most of his, he was mostly hunting. He was, hun he, he hunted in the, in the fall and whenever the hunting season opened and trapped in the winter time. And he was not a very rich man. He didn't, he didn't own any lands or no, no, no big buildings, nothing like that. And uh, my grandmother was a midwife. And um, Did you so go to tell us about the um, size of the town that you lived in? About 1,200 people. And Did you go to grade school there? Yes, my mother, she was nine years older than my dad because in the First World War from 1,200 people, 78 soldiers never came back and those ladies, they had, they had no boyfriends. And so I guess the Catholic Church managed that somewhat that at that time it was, um, I guess, accept, well, it always will be acceptable if somebody marries uh, somebody younger, but I imagine that that was one of the reasons. And... Uh, I went to school, eight years, grammar school, only in this small town, and I only had about three, three teachers. And um, the learning curve was not very, you know, it was not the structure that it is today. And then, of course, you, you had the war that started in 1939, I started in 1936. And, of course, during the war, many of the teachers were drafted. So you didn't, you know, you, you just had to take whatever it was. You had not much choice. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the olden time, it was um, not only customary, that, that's the way it ran, that you went eight years to, to school, you graduated, and you looked immediately for a job uh, as a profession, as an apprentice. And that goes for all kinds of trades, I mean, from carpenter to plumber to, to, to baker, butchers, hairdresser, you name it, all the, all the, all the professions were, were started, you must start at the bottom as an apprentice. And after three years, you, you, you had to take a test, and then you got the journeyman papers. And if you were a journeyman, you just probably just when they graduate from Purdue, <laughs> that you were proud that you were on your own. And then it was my dad's, um, one of his hunting buddies. He, uh, he says, well, to be a cook, that's a terrific, that's a terrific profession. Very interesting. And a chef always has something to eat, you know, in the war. That probably was one of the foremost things what people think about, food, every day. And so we, we signed up in Stuttgart in a small, in a restaurant, good-sized restaurant. And I started my apprenticeship on May 1st, 1943, right in the middle of the Second World War. So the cupboards were pretty empty. So the chef, he, he was a very frugal man. We would go out and... And he, we would collect snails in the springtime, snails, you know, which, which the French were very famous for. But they're also wild, they grow, they're also grown wild. As soon as the mushroom season started, we would go in the, in the woodlands and find all kinds of mushrooms. And my chef, my master chef, he was a, he, he was a very big expert. He wrote two books on, on wild mushroom cookery. And of course, wild, wild mushrooms became a meat substitute during the Second World War. And so I learned a lot. Uh, so on a day off, instead of sitting around, and well, of course, there wasn't much to do anyhow, you know. And so you would garden in the woodland and find and herbs and uh, 
and edible edible things mm -hmm. and and so I was that's I was, how you got started yes that's how I got started and then the war came uh, the war came to an end in in April of 1945 and I was then was occupied by the by the American forces and I was lucky to find a couple of GIs who spoke German and they asked me that I should go home and I sat there outside the house and cried and I said I can't go home because my parents they live in the Black Forest which is probably 75 miles away from Stuttgart and uh, he says uh, well where do you live? I said well upstairs in the attic and that I'm an apprentice and the one fellow from Milwaukee he says well check it out and so they came up and the next day they said well sweep the floors and help us and clean up and pretty soon you know I plucked the chicken and peeled the potatoes and I I got tired <laughs> and I worked five years for four years for the American occupation forces in in Esslingen on the Neckar real close to Stuttgart and then in Bamberg and then in Bayreuth and always with the same group mm -hmm. and so I had a very good start and they were after the Second World War, you know, the German chefs came back from the, from the military and they would work then in the officers club or, or in the general, Eastern was a general staff mess where I worked. So we had, we had some very good chefs, we had very good training. In Is that where you learned English? Yes, yes, I'm a, mm -hmm. but then I didn't speak it for a couple of years after, after I left, mm -hmm. but then and so I worked in Germany then after um, I went in the German economy in 1949 and, uh, and in 1951, 52 I went to Switzerland for two and a half years okay. and then I came back and went back to Germany and I worked in a, Blair, in a place equal to the Blair House in Washington where all the foreign dignitaries who came to, West, to the new Federal Republic of West Germany and I was, I was a young cook. Is that cook. a place that they stayed? That's where they stayed, where they resident. And you, you, would, you could find uh, from Haile Selassie to, uh, to, to Nehru and Sukarno and the king and queen of Greece and, and Haile Selassie, all kinds of folks which visited Germany. And I still have some, some uh, menus and uh, newspaper clippings and stuff like that. So. Okay. And of course, that is also kind of wonderful training because there's no room for being lackadaisical. When you, no. when you, the, the chefs and the whole crew, they would not allow you to, to do anything what, that had to Work. be very precise. Right. And uh, it teaches a lot of discipline and also, but you gotta treasure the God-given goods of this earth. Mm -hmm. Now tell us about coming to the United States, how that came about. Well, I was, um, I, I told you I worked in Switzerland, and uh, when I came back in, in Switzerland, I worked for a very, uh, during an ex exhibition, where there was a culinary exhibition which lasted 21 days and drew more than a million people, and they needed, they needed cooks in the international restaurant, and they hired, I was hired there as a journeyman cook. And, um, and the chef says, well, I'm going to open the the Hilton in Istanbul next year, and would you like to come? And I signed on and said yes. And when all the paperwork came back, the Turkish government didn't want anybody who was born in Germany, they only wanted the Swiss crew. So highly said I worked then at this Petersburg Hotel in, in outside of Bonn, Germany, and a young man who I worked with in Bavaria wrote me a letter and says, why don't you come to, to the Marat Hotel in Indianapolis? This was in 1956. And then, of course, we had to find, then he found me the sponsor, and the people who owned the hotel, they were my sponsor. And the U.S. Senator Homer K. Park from Indiana, he helped me to get, get all the papers, paperwork done. And so the hardest part was to find, to find a room on a boat. Because the you boats... You came by boat? Yes. Oh. So all the boats, they were jam-packed. And so finally, in October of 1956, I... I came to. Did you land? You landed in New York. Yes. In, so you in, saw uh, the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, I don't think I saw it, but I did go to Radio City Music Hall the first day I lived in the United States, and uh, then we flew. To, when I flew to Indianapolis, and then uh, the Murat Hotel had a very small gourmet room with about forty-eight seats, and this German friend of mine and myself and two, three waitresses and a maitre d', we took care. 
uh, like a European restaurant, uh, everything cooked a la carte. And so I had a very good, very good time, and I fit that kind of job. I, it fit me very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Were, was housing hard to find? No. Oh. No. You stay at the hotel? Or? Yeah, no. Oh. No, not, not at, that, at that particular time. No. Okay. Okay. But I stayed in some hotels where I worked since I worked, since I came to the United States. Then what was next? Uh, tell us about, uh, let's move a little bit to Purdue. How did you happen to come to Purdue? And well, uh, you know, you Purdue had, has this um, RHI department, <laughs> where I had the RHI department, and uh, when, when the bearings came to Purdue, and um, they found out that at Purdue they didn't have any, and that they didn't have a chef, they went and said, well, we're going to go and find a chef. And so when I I hired on in August of 1987, and of course Purdue didn't have any any liquor served anywhere on campus, so all the noble citizens who came to Purdue and, and important guests, they had they could not have an, uh, could not have a glass of wine, so the bearings they you know the since life has changed in the university and the state and, and universities have to ask their, their alumni for donations and so, more so now than 20 years ago, uh, the bearings went and entertained the VIPs out at Westwood. But unfortunately, Westwood was not a very luxurious uh, establishment which had a big kitchen or so. We, we, I cooked for many months on a five burner stove at Westwood and uh, then they would have a reception or a small cocktail party with appetizers and uh, then sometimes we did not even serve them a whole meal out there. They would come back to the, to the Memorial Union and have then the meal depending mm -hmm. how big the party was. Sure. Or sometimes only the guests who were at a party or were invited they would be out at Westwood. And I met some wonderful folks out there. I will tell you right. that. Tell, but back off a little bit. You were already at Purdue. Tell about when you first came to Purdue. You were here before the bearings came, were you not? No, oh, I you only I only was a guest lecturer around. But oh, Purdue, tell us about that. Purdue okay. had um, in an, in the extension in Fort Wayne and in and, and in Indianapolis, and so they we would. I was president of the Indianapolis Chefs Association in the in the late 80s, in the middle 80s. And uh, so, or oh, even before that, I, I used to give cooking classes, uh, adult education, I think they called it. In Indianapolis? And, in Indianapolis, uh -huh. and even in Fort Wayne. Okay. And, uh, at the, was this at the campuses? Yes, or? at the campuses. And so, so that was my first uh, mm -hmm. uh, connection with Purdue. And uh, it was very interesting. I mean, the and the folks uh, in, 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 in the, the Indianapolis campus and so they were always interested to to get us more but if you had a chef's job you you weren't you didn't have that much time to go and and and, and use and it as a hobby you know right right so then go on with so and so some of the, the other things you did Purdue. well when I came here of course uh, I worked half a day over at the Memorial Union and then a half a day over in Stone Hall with the students and of course we had the international dinner series which still exists today in the John Badu room and I was responsible to help the students select the menu because they changed the menu every day. It was like opening a new restaurant with a new crew every night. And depending how good how good a TA was or how good the training uh, how good we we trained them and, and made sure that everything was in place. Uh, some of the dinners were very, very fancy, I will tell you that, and pretty authentic, because we would use, if we had Italian night, we would use Italian cookbooks, and then I would guide them and coach them. Some nights they were not, they were not all that, that great. But there were always also highlights, like for instance, we would, we, we, we did sometimes, in summertime, serve people outside and make, make it like picnic. And one of my students was Ryan, Ryan Burning, a local boy from Lafayette, and I coached him, and then we also had a contest which TA could could attract more people. So we, you know, we we we, had, we, we judged them on how many customers they had because they had to go out and be their own 
promotion and advertising manager. Now they had to go and select the menu. They had to go and write me a purchasing order. We had to go and go over that one with a fine tooth comb, that it wasn't too much or that it, that it was proper, what we, that it fit within the perimeter of the price we were going to charge. Because for ten dollars or whatever we charged at that time, that was that was pretty the marginal as far as making a profit. And um, and of course, like in most departments, uh, Purdue is just as uh, keen in observing places where you lose money. And of course, that also would then reflect on my position as a <laughs> as the guardian angel <laughs> for those guys that that I wasn't worth my the salt for my soup. And so it was sometimes pretty, pretty exciting. But it was also exciting to see the enthusiasm of those young people. And of course, there was hundreds of questions they asked, and like little things, like uh, you tell a lady, a young lady or, or a young fellow, "Hey, come on, uh, make this whipping cream." And so pretty soon they come to you and say, "Chef, oh, it slushes." I says, "Oh, honey, don't worry. We make butter." I'll go, and they say, "What butter?" So you know that there is a lot to be taught when you're a teacher, how much you gotta teach them where, yes, where, where, the, where does butter come from? Well, it comes from the cream. Where the cream come from? Well, it comes from the cow. And those are the kind of things which sometimes that the young folks today who just were brought up in the city, they do, they do not have the knowledge. Yeah. Did they, was there any for a time when they had some you know, really big problems or people didn't come or? Oh, I, I'm sure that sometimes people make reservations and then didn't show up. Yeah. Today, it's hard to, was it hard to gauge how many to estimate? No, that would be sometimes, a sometimes after after the semester starts, you uh, the students go out and, and invite their friends and their uh, sorority brothers and what have you, and sure. and the the support between between the students when they look for guests is, is tremendous. I mean, they they will. The guy will try, or the girl will try as hard as to get get her four or six seats. And they, and and since it was a contest, and we did you, we did go and grade them on that. And uh, and then if you had a good year, of course it was not not all it was not all that uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. But it, some some of those things are really exciting when you think, how do you order, how do you plan, how do you execute, how do you decorate a table. How do you write that menu that, that the customers uh, uh, has, have, has have a good impression? And then to teach those young folks not to be afraid of a customer. How do you approach them? How do you greet them? And those are all kind of things which are good the rest of your life. And I always told my, my student, especially the girls, I says, well, Susie, or whatever her name was, are you alert? We, you know, are you with it? Are you... What we are teaching you is good for the rest of your life. And then I always ask them also, are you ready for him and for them? And they look at you and <laughs> tell you, them, well, are you ready for that husband you're going to have? And, and, the grand and the children's is going to come afterwards. And, and that is, I, I think that, that for a young person who, who, who goes to Purdue, even if they don't, uh, stay in the hotel or restaurant business. I think the, the training and the experience that they have in young life will be will be definitely a, a big impact on their sure. life. I mean, how do you set a table? And I mean, when you t when you think today, you invite, you know, if your husband then invites his boss, and you know something, some of the tricks what baby I taught you. And occasion, not occasionally, but often I get a phone call and say, oh, sh especially after I retired early, uh, <laughs> in 1980, beginning of 89, uh, 99, I retired. I was 69 years old when, when they sent me out to the pasture. Uh, they would say, oh, I could have used you. And I says, well, why didn't you call, <laughs> why didn't you call me? Now the, the, the excitement and something like that is great. Mm -hmm. But coming back to Westwood, mm -hmm. I must tell you that a hostess of the caliber of Mrs. Baring will be hard to find. She kept meticulously notes on the likes and the dislikes of, people, of the people. 
and she knew what their religious background is. So if they were, you know, that you couldn't serve them pork. Also if they were diabetics or if they had any, any, any likes or dislikes about food, we would, she would make sure that, that, we, that we do that. And I think that that is just uh, hard to believe. But then the same thing is when you think about graduation and, and they start early in the morning, and then there comes lunch on a break, and in the afternoon they got to go back to the second session. Well, there was absolute, Miss Bering was absolutely sure that none of the meat, none, none of the, the meals which were served were too heavy, too sweet, or too, that they would fall asleep, you know, or that it was, that, that, the, that the portion were too big. And those are all, those are all, uh, Key things. Little, little, little things which are absolutely necessary, and that's the same in a big hotel. That's what you know. That's when why they got some some places where four or five stars, because they do know what that customer uh, is is happy to, and the same like with the wines and with you know with, with all the anemones which go with it, right. and that is of course. Um, you know, from the flower arrangement to the menu to the invitation, and then Miss Bering had, and then Miss Bering had one other quality. She would, she would take the camera and take a picture, and two days later, you you would get a note, or a week later, you get a note and 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 your picture back. So I think that as a as a person with PR qualities, there there's no one like right. like Jane yeah. Bering. Yeah. I really loved him, and so Mr. Bering also very very wonderful. Wonderful people. I could have not asked in my life for, for any better bosses. And they were not really my bosses. They were, I mean, yes, they were my bosses and such, but we became very, very good friends. And they were always, you know, we always talked things over, and I don't think we ever had any cross words in all, those, in all the 10 years or 11 that I worked for, for them. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure. And did you still, do, uh, still were doing some teaching, working with the students at the same time? Mm -hmm. Oh yes, oh, oh yes. Okay. I, okay. I, 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 I left a couple hours and went out to Westwood and surfed and came back and checked them guys out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was, a, and of course, just like any other department, when I, when I was hired on at, at the Stone Hall, uh, before I came on board, there was a, con there was a correspondence between the, the vice president and the, the department head and they say, well, we can't afford a chef because the place made, made forty, fifty thousand dollars deficit the last year. Well, if you're a good chef, you you can you can eliminate that. You make sure you make sure that the garbage disposals are not running. You make sure that the doors are closed. You make sure that the that the storage um, that the food will be, you know new in, old out, you know, that, that you don't have any waste and all that. And there, in, in that area, I, I, I can brag on myself that I'm a pretty keen observer of... Uh, all details. Of, whale, of waste and, and what, can, what all can happen. Also, another problem is when you have a, a group of people who change every day in your kitchen, you have to be very safety-minded and always alert that there is no grease on the floor, that that somebody doesn't get burned or that they don't get cut or that they, you know, there is lots of those things and, and knock on wood, I've been very, very lucky on all my, all my career. No one ever got, got injured or so uh, badly injured. And, uh, Would, uh, did you do anything on the regional campuses at the time when you were here? Most of it was just here on no, campus? No, just here. Okay. Just here okay. on campus. Okay. Yeah. Well, we also started at Purdue, at, uh, at, at RHI some catering. So we catered, uh, at one time we did They were not doing, they had not done no, it before you no, came? No, no, oh. Or very little. The only thing they had was, I think, a child care center. Uh, the child, uh, uh, we, we fed the... Over oh, in the, Fowler House? Yeah, no, the, oh. they had a child care center separate and there was about 40, 40 kids and we served food to them oh. every, yeah. every day. But then we started to work with Granite and so all those, all those um, um, functions which were at Granard, we served them uh, breakfast, lunch, sometimes also dinner. And I also had occasionally a wedding. And one year, we did a party 
for the 700, and 700, cele 700 year celebration of Switzerland at the Indianapolis Art Museum. And we, I took about 20 students and we, we hauled all the wonderful hors d'oeuvres to, to the Art Museum in Indianapolis. I also took three or four students with me every year when I went to the 500 mile race. And I, I, was, I was working for a caterer on, 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 on those weekends from Indianapolis and I we took care of the Holman and George's suite. So I met all kinds of movie actors and politicians and all those and also my students, not just me because they and it was that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. And uh did you, did you ever do any weddings here on campus at all? Only one. Oh. I think I did one wedding. I did a couple of uh, bridal showers. Uh, a lady just called just told me the other day, Oh you remember Chef I you know, you did that nice thing for us. And I can't remember what the gag was. They had some kind of gag at, on this uh, uh, rehearsal dinner. Uh -huh. But it's always nice to see to when you meet someone again and they say, oh, my daughter talks about you. Or, or you, they will write you a letter and they say, oh, you, your devil eggs were the best. And, and all my... And and all all the people in my church, they they can't wait until I make them for them and all this. <laughs> and that gives that gives yeah. you great satisfaction. Yeah. Well, also, also when you find out how how rapid some of the students have reached. Uh, you you keep in touch with some of them. Yes, uh, uh, big jobs. I mean, one guy is out at Glacier Park and is food director. You know and. You look, you look at those things. So the next guy is on a boat, and the third guy calls you and says, oh, I'm on my, my, me and my brother, we opened a catering place in, in, in Fort Wayne and all this. And then that one of the young men who was British, uh, he, he went and became a, he, he ran the room service at Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York. And I mean things like that. Those are they, yeah. they got to be yeah. exciting. What's the placement for the students? Pretty. Oh yes, I I don't think too many. I I don't have any data from last year or so, but I have not seen too many. I have not heard too many students who graduate from Purdue in, in the hotel restaurant or even now in hospitality and tourism management who don't get a job because the the food industry is still vibrant. And the hotel, and can you imagine? You have the casinos, and you got the resorts, and you right. got the cruise ships, and you got all the. And then, of course, also the new, the newest ones are retirement homes where those folks can go. Country clubs. Can you imagine? I mean, yeah, the whole gamut. And and and. Uh, right. right. And America is, of course, today. You know, even now, this big, big business. Big business because housewives don't 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 cook that much, and a sad part, of course, is, is that that most schools do not have any home ec anymore. And I don't know they they look at that name home ec economist like if I don't know like if some kind of sickness. <laughs> well. But when you think that that all of, that we all 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 of us are supposed to have three three meals a day, or you know well. How do you know how to buy it? How do you know how to store it? How do you know how to fix it and, and, and make, make everybody happy? Okay. And when you think about the, if you have knowledge about food and when it is in season and when the price is right that you buy it, and that, is, that, that itself is, is, is a terrific education. But of course today we don't have any more seasons. They're gone. You know, Christmas, you have strawberries. Well, when I think back in 1950, when I worked in Bavaria, we had a pineapple. My God, we put it in a silver bowl and set it on the center of the buffet because it was exotic. But today they laugh. You know, they say, what are you talking about? Dime a dozen. <laughs> and, and those are the kind of things where the world around us has, has changed tremendously. And then in, in that case, when you're... My age, then you know they say, oh, "Yeah, it's old. He's old-fashioned." <laughs> so nice. I want to ask you about this special award, the Golden Toke Award. Well, I uh, the chefs, most trades in the world have 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 awards, and you know you talk about 
a master mechanic or a, you know, a, you know, and uh, and on and on. And the chefs, as a trade, they have had a very illustrious background. When you think the first chefs, they worked on the courts of the kings and of the noblemen. And then when in the 1800s, when they start building hotels and, you know, when the Waldorfs and the Ritzes and those folks came and built those big, big hotels in the big cities, well, then, of course, they needed chefs. And the chefs in Europe, we always thought that, you know, we, we didn't think too much about the Orient or China or India or so. I mean, they were lands far away. And so in Europe, of course, the chef's profession goes back hundreds of years, but then in the 1900, the French were the most dynamic guys. They wrote the Bible for the, the basic principle of cookery. How do you stew it? How do you saute it? How do you bake it? How do you boil it? Those, those basic principles of cookery were, were, were documented and, and taught in, in the old country by the French. And and the French, they also had a had a big influence on the big hotels in New York and in the big cities. And uh, the French were the, were the dynamites. And the French with the big chef's head, that was the sig the signature recognition thing for a chef. A chef without a head is not a chef. And so there was a man who came from France to the United States, and he instigated this in twenty nine or so. And he brought it over from France, and it's called the Golden, the Golden Talk. And the uh, organization exists since about 19, in the 1920s. And they can only have 100 members. And, he, and you must be, be um, uh, you must be asked by three members, bona fide members, to join. And on the, and on the yearly convention. The convention asked if we should should let this man or this lady into our club. And then the, the third year we, we install them in, in this with this in a very fancy ceremony hall, black tie affair with eight seven, eight course dinner. Not and then the best. In some of the best hotels you can find. Every year we change. And so in Three, uh, I'm in the in the Golden Talk now. Three years, and I had three, three sponsors, and uh, two of them have died in the meantime, and they were very well-known chefs. And uh, so you had to you have to earn it. You cannot you cannot join them. You got to be asked to join. Them. So I'm pretty proud very of being of being a member of the Academy very of the go Golden Talk. And uh, so the profession is. From all the professions, we are still probably one of the most aggressive, uh, the most, and also re uh, recognizable, because you have more cooking schools today in the United States than you ever had. I mean, in Indianapolis, they got three of them right now, and they all train in two years, very qualified cooks. We didn't have, they did not have this early, uh, earlier. There was no apprenticeship in the United States, but now with with the with the, the IV techs, you know, which are come, which I have popped up everywhere, and that is a, that's tremendous uh, pro progress. Just think, like you bring a new industry in a city, in a in a state like in the, like Indiana, when they built those casinos, and suddenly they, they had no cooks, no trained cooks, or no no servers, no no cashiers, no no purchasing agents, and I. In Europe, that was not possible because it was all structured, you know, and and for centuries, not just didn't just come and 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 and, and left and comes back again. So there is, but but there we are. The, the the profession, and when you think about television shows, I did on Channel Six in Indianapolis in the '60s with Jim Gerard shows, and we showed it one day, made a pilot pilot and we showed it to the guys and they said, ah, cooking shows, they'll never fly. Well, by that time they didn't have even uh, Julia Child on, on, on television or she was among the only one. Right. And so 
so I, I missed that boat. <laughs> Tell us a little about family. Do you have family here? Or? I, I was married uh, to, a, to a lady in Pennsylvania, and I have one son. Oh, and where does your son live? He lives in Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. I see him occasionally. We are not... You see him, does he do he, he does not have a... No. Cook. No, he, he is not. He, he was in, in transportation. He okay. was... And uh, he does not have any children. Okay. But he's got some good recipes. Oh, I'm sure. He, he, <laughs> he, he, knows, he knows how to cut a lobster in half. <laughs> Tell us what you're doing in your retirement. <clears throat> oh, that's a... Couple features on that. Well, the retirement that that was sort of a shocker when you the first couple of months when you have no longer any obligation, you have no no you don't have to make any plans, you have no more say so. That was probably some of the hardest thing. And um, you decide to stay in Lafayette. Yes, I I have a wonderful partner, a, a lady partner, for the last fifteen years and. Uh, we are just the best thing that ever happened to me. She was a widow, and uh, and uh, we we and we have friends, and I do mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, we entertain. I invite them to my house and make some fancy dish. But I I do I do still work. Uh, next week, next Monday, I'll be in at the state fairground, and I talk about uh, turkeys because um, um, the Indiana Turkey Marketing Council, they always have a boot at the fairground, and, they, and I go there and do a demonstration. This year I'm going to use ground turkey. And then I usually go for the egg producers, and I make uh, all kinds of egg dishes for them. For what group? Egg, the egg, because Indiana is a big egg producer. And uh, so, they, so that's very... That's very interesting, and I do that at the state fair, and, and also once a year the Indiana uh, State Poultry Association, they have a big um, yearly convention with all the people who raise turkeys in southern Indiana, and I go there and I do hors d'oeuvres for them, and, and a big banquet for two, three hundred people, and I help them and, and, uh, and, and pass out occasionally recipes. I don't, not, I'm not big on recipes. I have everything in my head and that's how we learned it in the old country, pass down and mm -hmm. write it down and and when you look at all the cookbooks which exist today, all those all those so called experts, they didn't write all those cookbooks, they just modified some of those recipes. So <laughs> but but I will um, another part of Purdue which really interested me and, and where I made lots of uh, not only friends, but a food science department, the animal science, uh, the aquaculture uh, at Purdue. I was very, I was always building bridges. Uh, and then, if some of the deans or department heads had uh, had had custom had uh, guests coming, for instance, uh, dean of agriculture, Mr. Thompson, one year, he says, "Well, you got to help me." Uh, the, the, Minister of Agriculture from the Ukraine is coming. And so we made shish kebabs and corn on the cob and what have you. And, and the translator, he, was, he, he spoke perfect German, so I had a very uh, wonderful relationship quickly with him. And he says, well, what impressed you the most when you came to the United States? And I had to think about it for a moment. And you know what it is? That the infrastructure of this country was so far ahead of anything I've ever imagined that you can pick up the phone and have the next day 20 lobsters flown to the airport when I worked at the Indianapolis airport, when I worked there. And that just boggles your mind. And that, and, and that, 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 that interpreter from the ambassador was definitely impressed when I told him that how fast things, things move in this country. And... Um, and I've met such, such wonderful people. Or just think of, of, uh, of Dr. Phil Nelson, you know, who invented the aseptic packaging. My God, what a, what, what a godsend for, for humanity when you think how, how the things were wasted before. And this goes on and on. For, the, for, for instance, we in the American Culinary Federation, which is the main chef's organization in the United States, we have now a separate part 
where there is 2,500 chefs who work in research and development for big food companies. And at one time, in 1970, I researched this, there were only three dozen chefs in the, in the whole United States who worked in a food company like Campbell Soup, H.A. Heinz Company, Sara Lee, Procter & Gamble, General Foods, you know, those kind of people. Mm -hmm. Or when you think back in the 50s or early 60s, there was hardly any frozen food. There was no convenience food. And all that has changed. And that, has, and that was not all invented by food scientists. They were mostly then the chefs. And from those 30 gentlemen who were the, who were the pioneers in, the, in, in, in research and development, I knew at least 25 of them. I met them. There was only four or five which I did not know. But those are amazing kind of little tidbits which the general public never will know. And, and same like, I mean, you know, what can a chef do? Well, you can do a lot of things. I flew a dinner to Washington for 500 people from Indianapolis with four other chefs, or five, and to the Senate Appropriations Room for the Indiana Society of Washington. Yeah, why do you do something like that? Oh, because I was... I was a friend of, of, of Senator Vance Hartke, and he says, why wouldn't that be nice? You know, what can we do to impress the, the people from Indiana in Washington? And on February 14, 1968, we flew a dinner from Indianapolis to Washington and, and had, in the Senate Appropriations Room, we had a big buffet, and we had, and all the people who, who came there uh, were all from Indiana, for instance, the uh, somebody from the uh, Supreme Court was a judge, and uh, the, the, gen the, the general from the American, uh, from, the, from the Marines, General Shoup, who I think was his name. And people like that were, were, were and, and that, that, something like that thrills me. And all the product we sent there was Indiana made. And the same like Purdue, when they have, when they have stuck without a big conglomerate to dictate them what should be on the menu. Purdue still has, f among the Big Ten, the only, m among the only university who has not a caterer uh, or, or not, a, not a national company who, who makes the menu and does the buying. And that is, I think, that is terrific. That's right, I agree. And Purdue should be ever so proud that in the Memorial Union and now also in the new in the new dining courts that they have that they have accomplished that. And the trend today is that the governor and some other folks, they would rather franchise it out than do it themselves. And this is the same like with, with working as a chef with the different departments. I mean like my friend Dr. Bill Stadelman, who was he's the author of the composition of the egg, another I don't know how many books he wrote. But that we that we could help the, the egg industry in, in this city in this state, and the turkey industry, and the, you know and that that is that's tremendous. I also I also do or did for many many years every fall um, with two with two extension agents from Purdue at game demonstrations that they would that they would skin a deer and I'd butcher it up and then we cut we had a, um, a grill which the one guy brought with his truck and we made small uh, uh, we, uh, deer tenderloin and we served it sometimes up to 80, 90 people. And there is no one else in the state who goes around and, and shows the hunters how to butcher up a deer. And I've done that for 10, 15 years. And, and those are the kind of things which, right. which make life very, very interesting. Right. And meaningful. Well, right. hopefully, right. you know, they're like, let me ask you this. Do you have an outstanding event in your life? One comes to mind? You share I a lot of them, they're good. I imagine you could, not, you could not be more happy than when they almost, when they play the national anthem for you. You know, when you win a gold medal on an international competition. Or, or I mean, or if you get a handshake from somebody like, like a President Car Jim Carter, uh, Jimmy Carter at, at Westwood. And uh, those are the kind of really really big thing or maybe the most one of the most uh, 
uh, not shocking, but surprising thing ever happened to me when, when I went to Taiwan. And the American Turkey Federation, they always, uh, Purdue never had to pay a dime. Uh, always the National Turkey Federation or somebody, they paid for my trips and I would travel. And I came to Taiwan, not in, in Taiwan, in a, in a city called Keishong, in the southern part of, of Taiwan. And I walked in this hotel in there, and there's a gigantic restaurant in the center and outside, outside on the, on the perimeter is, um, is a buffet. And people would eat from the different, some of them were, were European type food, some of them six different, from six different stations. And when I came back, there was this big turkey and this big advertising and my name. And the sign was two stories high. I, I think that that was the most I ever got excited when I, and of course I had a flight, you know, 12 or 14 hours, whatever. <laughs> but that was, some of those things are really, really surprising. Right. Mm. And they're neat, you know. Well, they, they, they stay in your mind forever. Right. And know. there is no, no way to, um, to plan it and no way to... Uh, but just enjoy it forever. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, still, I'm still surprised when I look at a picture that Somebody did this, and I, I didn't know, and you know, I had no influence over it. In closing comments, anything that you'd like to share? Anything special that comes to mind? About Purdue? Yeah, mm -hmm. Anything particular? Well, I think that sometimes uh, the knowledge, which is, which is so prevalent everywhere, that sometimes departments don't work together. And I and and I don't mean this in in any in any derogatory way to anybody in this great in this wonderful establishment here, but like, I did not know much about food and nutrition, as a chef. We I only know the principle of cooking. But now today, this society is diet conscious. Well, some of it is all bluff. Some of it is all hashed over and 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 just hype. But those people from, from upstairs in Stone Hall, they should go and, and, and guide us down here in, in the production kitchen. How does it work? And like the chefs and the dietitians, they were like for many, many years, like two worlds apart mm -hmm. because the dietitians didn't know how to cook, but it dictated you. And then, well, you know, how can you be diplomatic when you had to go and cook 10 different things with no salt, with no fat, with no sugar, with no... And if you weren't trained for those things. And there, I think that Purdue still could, could, could go and interdisciplinary uh, 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 exchanges. There, that, that's where I feel. And then I also feel that sometimes the different at least in my department, and I will, I will be, I will be their critical. In ten years that I've been retired, they have never officially, in hardly, no, I shouldn't say that I've been to a, to a cocktail party or two, but never that I could talk to the young students and inspire in them this fire of, of, of to to be great and to to follow to follow a career and build it as solid as humanly possible on the, bot on the bottom that you, that you succeed then at the end. And there I will, there I will uh, but I must also say that now I'm on the Purdue Retirees Association and I'm on the hospitality company for, uh, uh, on the, with the hospitality committee for the last five years. And it is absolutely amazing what the retirees still do for Purdue. And, and then it, it would be nice if then the different departments would be also very, very nice and appreciative of, the, uh, of their former colleagues. And there, but that is also, in my estimation, uh, a generational thing. It's not, it's not a person. It's almost the whole the whole generations, which is now in this world and in charge, they look at us and say, oh, they're old-fashioned, they don't know anything about computers, we didn't know. But they forget that we plowed those fields for them with their harvesting today. 
And I will tell that to any young man. Show me how to skin a rabbit. Show me how to pluck a chicken. Show me how to stretch that dollar. Show me your garbage can. How much did you use and how much did you waste? And when you think, what does a chef do? Well, a chef is a person who lives on this earth and he can take the birds from the skies, the fish and the crustaceans from the lakes and the ocean, and all the edible goods which the good Lord puts on this earth, and we transform it into goods, into food, which man makes happy, healthy, and hopefully peaceful. Good. Nice way to end it. That's very nice. Thank, Thank you very much. This ends the interview. Thank you very much.